Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Schwab Coaching for our next edition of Trader Talk in today's market. I'm your host, Kevin Horner, joining you all from Denver, Colorado. And today on this fine Wednesday, joined by my friend and Schwab coach, Brent Morris. Good morning, Brent. Nice to see you. How are you this today? Uh, doing doing great. I'm glad to be on Trader Talk this morning. Looking forward to a uh, you know holiday weekend and um, and uh, the day ahead. So I'm glad to be here. Excellent. You're right. We got to remind everybody that uh, Friday is, in fact, a market holiday. It's also a coaching holiday. That means we don't do shows on on Good Friday, but uh, not to worry. We will reconvene with you first thing Monday morning, uh, the following day on Sunday after Sunday uh, Easter, of course. But um, today uh, we're going to get into business as we often do with a broad market review. But our we're going to discuss another topic today, uh, kind of like we did yesterday. Yesterday's topic was uh, involving layering exit strategies, the idea being we can incorporate uh, perhaps option trading as a way to move out of our uh, positions a little bit more constructively. And we we accomplished that through our conversation with Cameron yesterday. Today, uh, Brent and I are going to discuss varying degrees of bullishness and how you might approach that bullishness, even in instances where the market's been really, really strong for, as we've seen for the last few months here. Uh, and the takeaway being that there's a lot of different ways to approach the way you're feeling about that move in the marketplace. So we're going to talk about that today. Our takeaway, I hope, is that uh, we provide you with some new ways to conceive of addressing the uh, the way you feel about how things have been going for us all here with this five-month-long rally. So ultimately, that's what we're going to get to, everybody. Let's get to some logistical details before we dive in. First, follow us on X. You can do that for us at Kevin Horner CS, at Brent Moore's CS. And today, we've got Ben Watson in chat. And please do follow Ben at Ben Watson CS. And then finally, remember to like and subscribe to the channel, everybody. Your subscription to our channel helps us immensely, particularly within the algorithm and those thumbs up buttons that you hit for us post show. You don't have to do it in advance. We'd much rather you tell us exactly how you feel. So let the show play out. Let us know that you liked it. And uh, if we get the opportunity for a survey, of course, we'd love to hear from you there. Now, Bear in mind that our discussion is exclusively for your information and education. Uh, remember, we do not make recommendations. We talk technical analysis, but continue to think of technical analysis as a complementary viewpoint to your fundamental research. Uh, today, we are going to discuss options a bit. It's important to remember that options carry a higher level of risk. They're not appropriate for all investors. You'll want to familiarize yourself with the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Uh, prior to investment. And of course, you do need to be previously approved to, tr to trade options at Schwab. So make sure you do go through the requisite steps. All right. So that eliminates our uh, logistics this morning. Let's talk about the good stuff, Brent. How about we look in on the SPX? Yesterday, I drew in a bull flag. Yeah. Uh, and at this time of the day, that bull flag was appearing as though we were going to break it. In fact, we had yesterday's open the first 20 to 30 minutes we traded through the high from uh, Monday. And that gave us an early think, uh, an early inkling maybe that we had a good day. Unfortunately, what happened is we kind of rolled over. We had one of those uh, close at the low of the day. And today again, Brent, we are right back to that same level. Pretty notable that um, that we're still there once more, isn't it? Yeah, and you know the market's been open for you know all of two or three minutes now, probably. <laughs> so uh, we'll we'll see where the, where the candle ends up at the end of the day. But hey, this is this is where we're starting. We're starting up. It it looks like it. It looks like there's a good chance we're going to have that breakout. Just what I'd say is. Look at this bull flag, and and if you look back in history, I mean, this is what bull flags do. They, you, if you look back as this trend has gone up, we have a lot of bull flags we could have seen. So this is a bullish pattern, <laughs> and you know, it it doesn't mean the trend is going to continue forever. It doesn't mean we're going to get this flag, right. but it is a matter of w w this is just kind of um, an example, I guess, of what traders look for in the market, but flag traders, flag patterns, bullish trend traders, this mm -hmm. is kind of a very, um, 
a, a common type of pattern that a lot of traders look for on this. And so, hey, you know, more of the same on the market. It seems like we, of course, I don't know what's going forward, but that's what we're we're looking at right now. I would tell you, uh, it's it's a good reminder of of the uh, the way that a trader will look for these concepts, these particular patterns to play out in uh, consistency over the length of a longer run trend. This being a five month yeah. time frame, the instances where we've had brief breakouts and small uh, breakout and then a brief pullback breakout and then a brief pullback and the pullbacks have all come to the 20 day moving average have been very consistent uh yesterday when i was on i was on the network briefly and talking about the s p 500 there uh the commentary that i noted was a quick change to the uh 30 day simple moving average in lieu of the 20 was pretty notable as well because the difference here is while the 20-day was violated a couple of times, the 30-day had not been. And it's just a good reminder, I think, that some traders prefer to go with the, the moving average. If you're work, working with a trend and you can see clarity from a proper moving average, Brent, they might just choose to go with the one that during the window of comfort for them has not been violated at all. We haven't had an intraday move below the 30-day, Brent. No, we haven't. And if you were to use the 30-day moving average, then a break of that would be deemed, I, I would think, you know, a, by a lot of traders as a very serious thing. Whereas mm -hmm. on the 20-day, you know, maybe we give it, uh, you know, you, could, you can wait just a little, little, little bit on that and, and you give, give it a couple days and see if it, it, if it rebounds there mm -hmm. on that. But 30-day would yeah. be a more significant break at that point. Yeah, and that's Brent. Let's just be. Let's admit why, though. It's as simple as it hasn't happened yet, right? Yes. Since November second, we haven't had that breakdown, and so it would be something different. And that's kind of one of those other things traders look for, isn't it, in defining the trend? That's well, in defining the trend, and and basically all of technical analysis to a certain extent, Kevin, is mm -hmm. look at what something has done in the past, and the the anticipation is that it will do that in the future. Now, of course, there's no guarantees on that because it breaks, but you know, trends break or support levels break. But if you think about support levels, resistance levels, price patterns, stuff like that, uh, you know, a double top pattern or whatever, it's you're looking at past data and saying, mm -hmm. hey, last time it was here, it bounced off this level. Uh, and therefore, the expectation is it's gonna bounce off it again. And so, you know, a lot of times when we talk about disclaimers, people will say, well, past performance isn't guarantee of, guarantee of future result. And that's true, but it's still the principle behind a lot of technical analysis, including this right here. If the, if the principle is in the past, it's never broken the 30 day moving average, at least never in over the past five months or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, then the expectation is it, as long as it's not breaking that, we're in, in decent shape on that, on that trade. Exactly that. Um, one of my favorite little cliches is that the um, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Yeah. So it will frequently come to a visual reflection that's very similar to what we've seen in the past. Yep. Uh, and again, when we talk technical analysis, everybody, let's just remind ourselves of what we're talking about. Probabilities. And if this is the probability, then I'm going to lean into that a little bit. I might be more comfortable staying on the long side of an SPX trade simply because we have an uptrend in place. Therefore, the probability leads you to think that the trend is more likely to continue than to break. That stated, if it does get a close below a 20-day or maybe the 30-day case like we talked, that would be significant enough of a development that a trader would say, aha, probabilities may be changing. And therefore, I might need to take some action. And today, again, as I noted off the jump, we're going to talk about ways to approach that change that you might be feeling in your comfort. Uh, and again, it's hard, especially when you've had a great move in the marketplace here. You know, for uh, the last five months, we've seen an immense move in the S&P 500. We've seen a fantastic move in the NASDAQ 100 as well. And the thing is, we can change our comfort a little bit just by maybe reducing the position we are owning or the amount of money we have deployed. And we're gonna talk a little further about those various things that traders might conceive um, to, to kind of manage the emotional tie to our investment dollars, which 
It is a really hard thing to capture, Brent. Uh, as much as we all want to believe that we can, we're all unemotional and just simply robotic in nature as we are trading. Um, that's really not always the case, unfortunately. That, that, that is probably rarely the case, and and yeah. that's why you know a reminder that we often give is that's why you set out trading rules ahead of time, and mm -hmm. uh, so that you're not you're you're trying not to rely just on that emotion. Yeah, hopefully ignoring it because unfortunately, yeah. I've at least how I've learned um, the instances that things have gone really badly for me is when I've made those decisions emotionally. Yeah. Where instead of actually thoughtfully, right? Uh, and it's easier to do it thoughtfully if you've ha conceived of it in the past, right? In advance of coming into that scenario. Uh, uh, you know what, Kevin? It's like dealing with kids. When you when you have kids and you know they're they're screaming or yelling or doing something, it's best if you've thought through how you're going to react ahead of time and not mm -hmm. just get caught up in the emotion of the moment. That's probably there's your parenting advice for the day, right there. I think we should all put a pin in that one, Brent. I like that one. That's a great reminder as well. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so relative to the NDX here, we I did adjust the moving average back to the 20-day. Uh, the 30-day here, probably consistent as well because we've seen that you know two days below the 20-day has worked for the trend. But it's also notable that the 50 has been maintained. Uh, we've got a little bit of a, of a move there between the two, Brent. The 20 day is around 18, 130, uh, and the 50 day is around 17, eight. So it's not a huge move, only about 300 points. It's a small percentage, only one and a half, maybe almost maybe 2% if you fell from the 20 to the 50. But when you're looking at a trend like this, Brent, again, the same, the song remains the same, more or less, right? I mean, the NDX, the SPX, they look very, very similar. The, mar the market is resilient right now, and we're seeing that across these broad-based in indices. And, uh, you know, I don't know, at, at some point things, things will change, but uh, that's certainly not right now. Uh, you know, the, the, I think economically, we're getting enough good news economically things are strong enough that the market can kind of justify continuing to go up we do have a pce number coming out friday when the markets are closed by the way so we mm -hmm. wouldn't see a reaction until monday on that you know could that change things well maybe i don't know could fed statements change things well maybe but you know the the the, the data seems that it doesn't appear that the U.S. is going into a, any sort of a, a really significant recession at this point. Now, they can change. Um, and so the, the market just keeps on marching along here on uh, large caps, uh, you know, uh, on the NASDAQ we're here. And, and even the Russell looks a little bit different, but still not, not terrible. Yeah, let's do that. Let's move over to the Russell here. Uh, I'll just point out that um, you know the Fed speak we have heard in the last week plus has done very little to alter the expectations as it relates to the CME Fed tool. Uh, expectations for the May 1 meeting coming up uh, are to hold steady at about 91%. Uh, it's in June where things get a little squirrely. There's some uh, positioning suggesting a 25 basis point cut at around 60 plus percent right now, 64%. But um, again, these are just the way that traders are positioning based on Fed funds futures. It is not a guarantee in any way, shape or form, everybody. But um, what's intriguing to a lot of individuals, of course, is the movement in the Russell where we continue to hang out well above the 2000 level, Brent, that had been previously so important for us. Yes. From a, from a technical standpoint, uh, you know, th things are strong. We're, we've maintained the support level that hasn't cracked. And mm -hmm. I guess, you know, from the going back just real briefly to the macro level, you know, the Russell has traditionally been, when I say traditionally here, especially over the past, you know, I guess year, um, has been more sensitive to the whole rate cut situation, the inflation situation, the debt situation. These are a lot of companies, a lot of these companies have a lot of debt. And uh, they're very sensitive to debt financing costs and interest rates. And so this, this has reacted quite a bit. And is, it, it's kind of been, I guess, the odd man out in terms of the big three, threesome here of the SPX, the NDX, and the RUT in terms of 
performance in terms of what the chart has looked like, but it, it is strong right now and the support is held and relatively bullish. Yeah, uh, I would love to argue with you because I think it would provide a better conversation, Brent, but it'd be really hard to do so given the nature of the chart. Yes, it's a little uh, a little congested at this area, you know, 2050 up to the 2100 that we briefly touched. But I, again, I think as many of you have heard me say over the last few weeks and months is that the notable uptrend line remains pretty important here. Uh, the fact that we've got uh, this ascending triangle and we remain above the high of that former ascending triangle in here is perhaps giving bulls a little bit of confidence. Now, they're not going to feel a whole lot of confidence, Brent, until we can get through that 2100 level and make some new shorter term highs because we can see how that has been for us, at least just in the last couple of months here. Uh, or last month plus actually. And then in one quick vi view of it on the weekly shows the importance once more here, everybody. Once we had lots of support back there at that 21 to 21 and a quarter area on the RUT, getting through there could be quite significant. And let's be honest, getting through there could be quite bullish for the Russell Brent. It sure could. And it, this longer term chart, you can see some, some of the difference between, uh, you, you know, we're we're a long ways from all-time highs on the Russell 2000. Mm -hmm. It's very different than uh, these other indices we're talking about here. So we'll see. Absolutely. And also one other thing I would add, Kevin, is you know, this kind of confidence level we're talking about. The, a confidence, you know, sometimes people get a, traders have this feeling that, well, look, things have been going really well, g giving you confidence. But in the back of their mind, you have to realize Hey, there's been a lot of times in the past where traders have been conf confident and then the market has changed on them. And regardless of what the technicals are, which the technicals have been fairly strong, which we've been noting, there's times when you as a trader are looking at it and going, well, yeah, we, I know things have been going good, but I also realize that things may change here. And so that is that is, and whether that's through just, you know, considering market valuations or just the general sense that, well, we've gone up a whole lot lately, mm -hmm. there's a, a chance things may change. That's why some traders sometimes prepare for, um, you know, um, they, they adjust their portfolio based on uh, not any so current signs of weakness in the market, but actually kind of based on strength in the market. It's kind of the weird, weird uh, weird thing there, but uh, that strength, market strength, which we've been seeing can actually lead some traders to adjust their portfolio. Yeah, it can for a number of reasons, actually, one of which yep. is the idea of allocation percentages, for example, yes. you know, if you as a trader are following rules in your trading portfolio that say, yeah, I want in, I want to be invested heavily. I want 80% to be invested all the time. But I also want to be able to manage the day-to-day -day market machinations that I can get. So I don't want to be in 10 trades all in technology. Maybe I want three yes. in financials because for because the financial space is moving. I also want a couple trades in industrials because that looks bullish. And these are just example commentary. I'm not suggesting this is what you'd be thinking. But uh, the idea is understanding your personal preferences and approach and one of those ways to reduce risk is to kind of spread the assets amongst various sectors. We talk about that all the time from a long-term standpoint, Brent, but that can work even for the trader, can it? Uh, absolutely, that can, uh, that can work for the trader. So you just be aware of your market allocation. And so when you have a portfolio, one, realize at least what sectors each of your stocks are in in that portfolio. And one easy way to do that is like, Kevin, why don't you go up to the monitor tab and on that position size, go, yes, yeah, you, you're reading my mind there, just type in sector there and, uh, and that'll tell you what sectors uh, your portfolio is in. And b believe me, we're not suggesting that you need to uh, have, the, you know, 11 sectors all different here by any right. means. But right. if you look and you see, oh, it's energy, 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 energy. Um, and, 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 you know, that that could be, uh, you could be putting your portfolio at risk there. I remember talking to a fellow, uh, oh, this was a long time ago. This was probably close, close, better part of 15 years ago. And he was telling me his portfolio was all in, actually, 
energy because it was the time when energy prices were going crazy. And sure, his portfolio returns were very good. Well, a few months later, what, what ha had happened, energy had crashed, of course. And I didn't talk sure. to him after that. And I don't know if he was nimble enough to get out and change and, and whatnot. But uh, that, to me, that's just an easy way of just being kind of cognizant of what of, of your your portfolio allocations there in terms of your sector. So use use your Thinkorswim desktop platform like this if you have it to uh, to just you know be be uh, aware, customize it for your needs. And one of those needs may be to just realize, remember what your portfolio allocations are. It's a great reminder, Brian. I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny, you're right, because it's the moment you said it, I was like, oh, yeah, I should have that in there. And I, I just said, all right, let's go there and put that in. And then you were on the money talking about it. So you can also go with industry group, by the way, everybody yeah. it doesn't have to be as broad as sector. You could drill into your preferred industry groups uh, and that'll make it a, a little bit better as well as uh, as John, the noble savage is pointing out. Yeah, the whole point of a portfolio is to uh, diversify a little bit and that will reduce risk, at least in the long run. That's the way that most traders, excuse me, most investors go about their diversification uh, and, and um, uh, addressing risk is through diversification. Traders take a very different approach, but that doesn't mean that we should not be cognizant of the sector in which our stocks reside and realize that if you want to have a, an opportunity for an up day every day of the week, the odds are you can't do that in one single space, right? You got to have uh, some investment dollars spread amongst the groups that are all working simultaneously. So yeah, that could be industrials, could be materials, it could be financials, energy, et cetera. Uh, we have 11 domestic sectors to work with, Brent, and a recently review of all of them says that the majority are in bullish uptrends right now. The majority are in bullish uptrends. In fact, I think uh, in terms of, let's see, I was just, uh, there was just a couple that maybe were not above their 20-day moving average, uh, healthcare and discretionary maybe. Um, but, and those are only because of recent pullbacks. Yes, so, and that's uh, only because of uh, recent pullbacks, correct. But if you if, look, I mean, that's above its 20-day moving average. Above that's discretionary it. actually. Um, so I'm trying to see. think Real, which ones. Let's see here. Let's just zoom in and see here because we got our orange 20 on there. So there's yeah. energy above the 20. There's materials clearly above the 20, even potentially breaking of a of a bull flag as we speak. Industrials above the 20. There's discretionary above the 20. Staples breaking out of a bull flag. Healthcare, but breaking a, a lengthier oh. consolidation. Now uh, here's your financials above the 20. Tech on the 20. Communications above the twenty, yes. utilities above the twenty, but I, I was still I stand corrected. Trend. Maybe there's zero. I, so there. do I, Brent. I mean, I'm so. shocked. Wow. And then real estate. Let's round it out. Oh, we found one. We're not. One of them's not. Okay. Real estate is not above the twenty. So that is one of the eleven sectors in the U.S. market that is not above the twenty day. That is an uncommon scenario, Brent. It um, is. It's a broad base. And that's something different than what, that what we're seeing in the market now than what we were seeing a couple months ago in that, yes, the market as a whole was, was going up, but it was so, the narrative was so much, look, it's these, you know, mega cap companies. It was semis. It was, uh, you know, tech communication th mm -hmm. that was, was really pulling the whole market uh, up and that you know we we would look at the difference between the uh, SPX equal weighted and the S and P five hundred and you'd see this huge diff difference and there there's probably still a difference there but the 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 rally has broadened and a lot of traders feel uh, a lot of market observers feel that's actually a very healthy thing in the market not where you just have one or you know uh, one industry or one sector really just pulling the market along. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, the again, the approach is one that we hope is is constantly conceiving of what might be coming and utilizing that concept of what might be coming with a follow step of how I'm going to act if it does. Right. So, um, Brent, let's 
take our conversation into a discussion of management of our existing portfolio, yeah. our example portfolio, but also a conversation around the various ways traders might become a little less bullish without foregoing necessarily opportunity. Uh, so in the midst of strong moves, Brent, we talk all the time about raising our stop orders, trying to capitalize on upside momentum. But Brent, there's a lot of traders out there that might be feeling a little uneasy here based exclusively on the fact that we have continued to run for as long as we have. And we continue, of course, to have a narrative overhanging us. And the narrative is uh, very simple. We've run so far in a very brief window of time. A, this can't continue. And you hear it all the time, Brian, especially if you pay too much attention to the social media aspects out there. Uh, it's really easy to be um, influenced by some of those comments, right? And we want to ignore that as best we can. I try to bring the idea that that's all noise, generally speaking. That said, it can impact our decision making. And so, Brent, we talk a bit about reducing position size, selling yep. shares a little along the way, generating cash. Uh, but there are other ways we can do, uh, we can stay uh, bullish and invest without necessarily devoting new money to the trade. And one of those ways is uh, considering the concept of selling puts, which, you know, when we talk puts, Brent, many traders instantly think, oh, puts are bearish in nature. But that's not always the case. It's always about what side of the market we are on. And so talk to us a little bit about the idea of selling puts and why a trader who is still bullish might prefer this process in lieu of simply owning stock. Yeah. So when when you sell a put, you are agreeing to buy a stock at a strike price, a specific strike price, on or before a given date. You get to choose the strike price. And mm -hmm. depending on what strike price you choose, that'll adjust the amount of premium you bring in. You get paid to sell the put. So... Um, so that that's basically what a short a short put is or selling a put is it is a mm -hmm. bullish strategy but it has kind of a different risk profile than the you know just a a, a stock buying a stock or um doing other option strategies such as buying a call option which would be more bullish the in the case of selling a put you get to choose the strike price. So what one approach is to say, hey, I'm going to buy, I, I, I like this stock, you know, I don't, whatever, XYZ stock. You like the stock, but, it, you know, market valuations seem a little frothy and mm -hmm. I'm worried the market may pull back. Uh, and so I'm a little worried buying at the current price. If that's your mentality, what you may say is, Hey, but actually buying, if it does get a pullback, may make sense. And therefore, uh, I'm going to sell that put at a strike that's lower than the current stock price. If the stock doesn't go down, I still bring in that premium. You get to keep that premium no matter what. Right. However, if the stock go does go down, then there's more likelihood you'll end up buying the stock. However you're buying it at the reduced price, at that strike price. Now, it only goes so far in terms of helping you a lot because if the market truly crashes and the market just goes way down, 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 mm -hmm. ultimately you risk, you risk the difference between the strike price and, and zero if it were to go all the way down to zero. And so really the, ri the total risk isn't that different than buying a stock. It's a little different because you're bringing in that premium that you get to keep up front. But in right. terms of just kind of normal market pullbacks, it gives you the opportunity to kind of manage a portfolio, decide ahead of time what price you're willing to buy that stock for and potentially get in for that stock price. It also adds positive theta to your portfolio. Theta, for those of you who are not aware, is time decay. And time decay may sound bad, and sometimes it is bad with options trading. But positive theta, time decay can work for you. And this is one of those scenarios where time decay will help you out on your trade because that what that means is, you know, everything else being equal. 
each day, uh, theoretically, there's uh, some benefit to your option price based mm -hmm. on the, uh, the just just the mere fact that the day passes. Exactly. Exactly. So when we are long, that time decay works against us. That theta works against us. When we are short contracts, it works in our favor. Uh, and, you know, there's let, let's talk about it from an example scenario. I think we can provide a little more color if we looked at an individual position that could give us an opportunity for discussion. Um, one of them that I was looking at this morning, we're in the cruise line zone. Let's look at uh, Norwegian here. NCLH is the symbol. And again, we're not uh, recommending the stock. We're looking at a uh, potential trade concept more than anything else. And, yeah, we're talking vertical. This, in this case, would potentially be a uh, a short vertical situation whereby we consider selling a put at a strike price where now this is key i believe everybody where you want to own the underlying stock so let's approach nclh norwegian as though our approach says you know what i like the fact that it's in an uptrend uh i would like to own this over a longer window of time but I don't like the idea of buying at re near resistance, right? And so a trader might say, yeah, I see it's at 20 or thereabouts, 21. If it broke through there, it may have more upside. But I'm a little uncomfortable about devoting $2,000 to the trade. But what if I said I wanted to own the stock down here at where maybe would be prior support? So here we have that zone, Brent, right around 18 and a quarter. And some traders might say, yeah, I'd rather own it there. So, of course, we could do a bullish viewpoint, Brent, that says just buy me the shares at a limit of 18 or 18 and a quarter, right? Yeah. And you yeah. might get lucky. You might not get the shares. But when you look at the options available to you, and if we were to go out to just the standard monthly for April, which is just open there for me, knowing we were looking at that $18 approximate level, maybe $19, we're not looking at a whole lot of premium, unfortunately. So one of the things that stands out to me is I'm not getting a lot of so-called juice from selling uh, uh, contracts on Norwegian here, very likely just because the position's not very volatile right now or does not have a lot of implied volatility. Sam, I am absolutely, we should be considering implied volatility, right? To a certain extent, it'll have an impact on how we, uh, how much premium we're able to bring in. But I think the, the reminder I wanna give Brent is that to the trader who's saying, I'm, I'm bullish, but a little unsure. And you know, the reminder is, if I wanna buy 100 shares, I have to outlay $2,000 at 20 bucks, right? But if I wanna simply commit to being a buyer at $19, I will have a hold on $1,900 total, 100 shares times the strike price at which I could be put shares. Okay, so that would be 1,900. I'll have to hold that cash aside or it'll be earmarked to be spent like that. But I'm going to be paid, in this case, about somewhere between 22 and 28 cents or dollars, if you will, to take that premium or excuse me, to take on that contract, Brent. So, yes, it's a bullish scenario, but I, as the trader selling those puts, I have a lower risk factor by virtue of the fact that the stock is in an uptrend and instead of owning it, I am committing to buy it later on. Right. So. There's still plenty to be bullish about in a stock that's got an uptrend like that, Brent. But at the same time, the trader who doesn't want to devote that much cash doesn't have to. Right. And and so remember the upsides and downsides of this strategy. The upside is if the stock stays where it's at or if it goes up or even if it goes down a little bit, but doesn't even go down to our strike, which we were talking about 19, I think. Mm -hmm. You're getting about approximately a 1% return on this from the premium. The premium, I think, was like $0.22, cents, which is basically yeah. 20, $22 for the 100 share multiplier, which is, represents just over a 1% 1, 1 return. Not a huge return, but if you right. think about that in the context, this is in, wh what was our expiration? That was like 20 days out or something like that. Yeah, and so, a long time. Um, so you know that's that that's the the pro on this, and the other pro is if you do end up buying it, you're buying it at a, a lower price than where it is now. That's that's a good thing, uh, 
And, but there's always the risk that, uh, you know, it is it is still a bullish position. And if Norwegian Cruise, in our example here, just starts trending down and goes down, 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 then it's not it's not an ideal situation, which is why you, you want to do this only on bullish stocks, only on bullish stocks. And one before I forget, let me just give everybody one reminder. When you're selling puts, when you're selling options, they can be assigned early. So, Always. and it, that may not be such a terrible thing, actually, but it, just realize that that is one situation, regardless of, you know, of your, wherever, whenever your expiration date is, that doesn't necessarily mean it could be assigned early. Now, mm -hmm. if you did want, if you're saying, well, that's not really, I want more premium, well, then you could look for farther out in time, okay? Instead of 20 right. days, we can go out 40 days or something like that, and you'd see those premiums would be higher, but you're also locking up, you're in this position for longer and giving the stock more chance to, I guess, go down farther against you uh, in that way. It's true. Uh, Brent, real briefly, I wanted to do the math on that for our viewers. I'm just curious, is there a, like a rule of thumb that some traders use when selling puts in terms of trying to get, garner a percentage um, of the of the equities underlying price? Well, I, boy, you know, you talk to different traders, you're going to get a different you get a different answer on on everything. But a lot of traders would say, I, you know, I kind of I I kind of have people think about that one percent from this perspective. The math is easy. You have a twenty dollars stock. What's ten percent? Excuse me, one percent. One percent is going to be twenty cents. Okay. You have a seventy dollars stock. One percent is going to be seventy cents. That's kind of a baseline for where to look. And a lot of traders will say, "Look, if I can't get one percent on this thing, I'm not. It's not even going to be worth my time there in terms of in mm -hmm. terms of doing this." Now, if you're looking out and you're looking out, say roughly a month. And you're getting uh, you're you're getting four percent, five percent. Then that tells me one of two things: one, you're either selling this contract as right, basically at the money or in the money, right? Or your implied volatilities are absolutely through the roof on that. Yep. There. And so, uh, generally, a lot of traders will look for something in the one to two percent range on this type strategy, maybe three percent. But when you start to get higher than that, it means you're probably at the money, which isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as you're, if you're more, you're more likely to end up buying the stock in that case. If you're selling the contracts mm -hmm. at the money, you're getting rewarded for it. You're getting higher premium. Um, I don't know. That's probably how I would uh, tackle your, your question there on that, Kevin. I, I appreciate you answering it the way you did. I, I actually, I think that makes sense. Um, a ballpark in the neighborhood of maybe up to 2% is kind of an approximation where maybe it's it's kind of like a 50-50 delta, right, as to whether you can, you're can you going to be assigned on that over the life of the contract. Uh, when you get into that 3 plus percent, then you're increasing the likelihood of execution uh, on the underlying, becoming underlying shares for you. I did the math on it, like you said, Brent, we're about 80 cents divided by the market value at 20 and a half gives you about a 4% likelihood. And of course, that makes perfect sense. We're talking about the $20 and 50 cent foot that is now based on 2045 is in the money by a nickel. So that means that you're at risk for taking on stock at $20 and 50 cents immediately the moment you place that sell order on the put contract. Uh, we should of course point out that when we're selling a put like this, you can work to reduce your risk further of being put those shares and then having downside risk thereafter just by simply owning a long put to spread off, if you will, your short put. And what do we mean by that? It's simply giving you the chance. So if we were using that 20 and a half as our entrance or our short put strike price, we'll bring in 80 cents a contract to do that or $80 to devote to a hundred share position essentially. But if we said, you know what? I don't wanna lose more than a dollar a share if I get put those shares, then you might own the 1950 put thereafter. Now that means you're going to spend a little bit of uh, the premium you bring in, Brent. Yes. Right? You're going to cut your premium. Half the premium I'm, in in 82. Yeah. I'm going to spend half of it to protect my downside. 
but it also means you you have a defined risk strategy and you know definitively your trades either going to go one of maybe three total ways and they are all very well defined yep you're cutting the risk you're cutting the margin requirement but you're also cutting the premium you're bringing you're bringing in as well so yes. it's always uh you know there's no free lunches out there kevin <laughs> that's such a great reminder you're absolutely right everything we do comes with a trade-off in some way shape or form absolutely right and just one uh, more okay. comment on this strategy Please. here because it's I, I know some people mentioned implied volatilities if you look at norwegian cruise line you actually have fairly high implied volatilities there up in the 40 percent range, which means you're probably, you know, there's more chance of getting a higher premium. If you start to see implied volatilities in the low teens, maybe mid teens on a stock, you're going to struggle likely finding premiums that seem very attractive to be, to be honest on that. Cause uh, now once you get above 20, then it, you're more in the realistic range of getting premiums that seem now on the other extreme, you know, you bring up something like, let's do, try super micro or something like that, uh, Kevin. Uh, sure. Implied volatilities are going to be, we'll see what they are, 88% or whatever. And and so, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, the benefit is you're looking at really a juicy premium, so to speak, but you're also see a looking at a stock that the market is anticipating as implied volatilities or expected volatilities of moving a heck of a lot. And so that may not be, you know, it just depends on the trader. Some traders shy away from those type of stocks there on the, mm -hmm. in, in this trade. And, and the implied volatility is kind of a, a clue to you on those. So uh, great, great reminder and, and additional context, Brent. Uh, I, want, I realize that when we're talking about this strategy, this might be a little bit advanced for some traders who are still figuring things out, and that's perfectly fine. The reminder we want to offer, of course, here on Schwab Coaching is exactly we're here for that. Uh, learning is an ongoing process. It's not a there's not an end game in mind here. We're constantly learning, trying to improve and get better. I'm placing in our chat request, our chat uh, discussion, everybody, a link to the playlist on getting started with options for those of you who would like to learn more about some of these concepts that we've covered today specifically. Just a reminder that our archive uh, continues to grow and that particular playlist, you can go back all the way to November and you'll find a number of great conversations. Uh, that class is led by Barb Armstrong traditionally, but you're gonna find a few of us in there periodically. Certainly recommend uh, checking that out when you get an opportunity, everybody. Uh, especially if you're if this is an avenue you wanna learn more about. Hopefully that's the takeaway uh, today. Brent, yeah, in fact, yeah, Kevin, let me just oh, mention something regarding that. Uh, yesterday, I taught a class in Barb. For Barb, Barb's been out the last couple of weeks. She'll be back next week. But yesterday, I, I taught a class on short put verticals. The week before, I taught a class on short puts themselves, where we where I d was able to vote, you know, full session to each of those yes. strategies individually here. So <laughs> if if that was a little fast for you, you could check those out. And I go a little bit slower uh, than what we were able to go through today on that. And thank and thank you for doing it that way too, Brent. I realize that in this conversation, we've uh, we've kind of been speedy in our process. Maybe that's it's a good thing because it hopefully whets your appetite to learn more and and maybe brings you back for another conversation. But ultimately, again, I wanted to remind everybody that while we can be bullish, there are ways to be bullish without being as um, yeah. aggressively tied to the market with our investment dollar. And and certainly, you know what, if you had a portfolio of cash and you didn't have comfort owning underlying stock, but you knew strike levels, prices at which you would like to own those stocks without question, without equivocation, then those become perhaps sell put opportunities for you to try and you know take advantage of moves that go against uh, those underlying stocks. That's one way that traders will look to get into those stocks at uh, discounted rates. So some things to keep in mind, and hopefully that was helpful uh, for some of you. So we are at the, the final end here, um, uh, Brent, of our uh, conversation today. But I just wanted to peek in on the example portfolio and remind everybody of what we're looking at. I'm going to go ahead to the chart. 
and then just kind of move through some of these brief positions and see if we have anything we need to adjust real quick. So Schlumberger is one we raised our stop on yesterday with Cameron, and then we have a covered call sale against it. So uh, that position will uh, continue to run, but we don't need to make any adjustments there at this point. We have a recently added Visa that is sitting on a 50-day moving average, but we've got our stop order protecting yep. us there. Reminder, we know that stop orders cannot protect us entirely. We have gap risk. So even though we might be set for trigger on this particular stop, at 275.98, we can be executed at any price, everybody, uh, upon a trigger. Uh, the other ones, let's see, real briefly, GE. My goodness, Brent. Um, I just bring this one up because it looks like we might be at a spot where we could raise the stop. When you look at what's going on here, we are potentially at new highs, maybe waiting to see if we bust through new highs. But how might you look at this real quickly, Brent, if you were thinking about it? Would you raise the stop or give it a little more time and see if we could actually break out? Yeah, you, could, you could probably raise that a little bit. You don't want, you, there's a good chance a trader wouldn't want to raise it too tight. You know, you, you'd likely give it a little breathing room, but some traders may move it up. You could, you could see what like an ATR is and look below that 168. We may, have not time, may not have time to do that. Or you could just do a percentage below that 20-day moving average or... If you want to go oh, a little yeah. tighter, you can go below the recent bounce a couple days ago, but you'd go a percentage below it to give it a little wiggle room there, likely. Let's see. Just quickly, ATR is $3.60, and the 20-day is one sixty eight. So we would have to be under one sixty five. Yeah. And we could go so we could go to one sixty five just doing a little bit of quick math on that. So why don't we do that? Let's just go up to there around one sixty five. Under the twenty day we would have to break if if that were the case. It is gonna stay a good till canceled stop order. So you know we just keep ratcheting that one higher everybody in the hopes of capitalizing and taking on some more profits. Uh, of course, no guarantees on that, but we're given the chance, Brent. We need to take advantage of the upside moves and and work to generate cash when things start to 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 pull back or or reach levels where we no longer have comfort. But remember, that comfort can change, right? And and you can generate, you can still be bullish by selling off some shares. Yep. Uh, look to these alternate strategies we've covered today, Brent. I think this has been very fun. Thank you for joining me, and for of course reminding our viewers that you've got some excellent archive stuff that they should be looking for. So appreciate you being here. Well, glad to be on here, Kevin. And uh, coming up next, we got short verticals. I think you know, uh, right. apropos to our discussion. Here and uh, just remember, stops are not guaranteed, everybody. Uh, that right is correct. Today. Like and subscribe to the channel, everyone. We appreciate you joining us. Thanks to Ben Watson in chat. Have a great Monday. Uh, excuse me, Monday, Wednesday, everybody. We look forward to seeing you all again real soon.